Hello and welcome to Reading in Bed Extracts with me, Amanda Steele. I'm one half of the main Reading in Bed podcast team. And before I get started with today's extract, I'm going to talk about a writing workshop which I'm running with my other half of the podcast team, which is Andy N. And that's going to be on the 14th of November at 3 o'clock UK time. It's £1.67 per ticket and it's going to be on Zoom. It's open worldwide but you'll have to work out the time difference if you're not in the UK. And I'll include the details of that in the write-up to this show. So, on to the extract. I'm reading an extract today from Dark Fear the Reviled by Cynthia Morgan. And I'm not reading from the beginning, so I'm going to read a little summary first that will help you to understand the extract. Isla is a young fae of the light, but she isn't an ordinary fae. Though many fae have gifts such as magic, empathy, telepathy or discernment, Isla was born different. She has a remarkable combination of all of these gifts that sets her apart. Unique though she is, she is also isolated and has only two close friends. But when she begins sensing a presence that lingers in the shadows around her, she tells no one. Garunzbul was a fae of the light, but he was abducted by the dark fae, the reviled. When he was only seven, the dark fae are everything, the light fae are not. They are cruel, sadistic and regularly steal fae of the light children, because they are unable to produce. Garunzbul suffered 15 years of captivity among the reviled, but he has never given up hope of escape. He longs to return to the light and to freedom. He discovers a way but needs the help of at least one fae of the light to succeed. Learning of Isla's remarkable gifts, he tries to communicate with her, hoping she will listen when no others would. One dark night, Isla is watching a child fae for a couple called away from the village. She is alone in her cottage with the child until a dark one appears. So that was the summary and here's the extract. She recognised her folly immediately, in striving to protect the child she had unwittingly sacrificed herself. In the darkness of the hall, as he dragged her unfaultingly towards the only room in her home containing the mirror, she recalled the dire and dreadful warnings given to all young fate as they entered youth. A mirror never stood in a sleeping chamber, for a mirror could never be left in darkness. Should a dark one cross over, he would open the portal the mirror provided and summon his legion. Then they would cross in untold numbers, visiting such vile acts upon the young fate as could never be named. They would only return into their own realm when the first light of the sun crossed the horizon, leaving ruination and despair in their way, and oftentimes death. No, she shrieked in absolute horror, straining against his grasp, leaning away from him. Scratching at his hand, beating her wings with every ounce of strength she possessed, but her resistance seemed more of an inconvenience to him than a problem. Tugging her along behind him, he strode purposefully into her boudoir, a private chamber of preparation, and turned toward the mirror, raising his free hand towards the reflecting glass. He arched his wings as if setting himself against the foe and closed his eyes, beginning an incantation that was not spoken in the Dalf tongue, but in a language she did not immediately understand. Where were all the spells of protection she learned as a child? How could she have forgotten after repeating them literally thousands of times until she was wary of speaking? Her mind spun, her terror choked her, her breath came in ragged gasps, she shook like a willow in November wind, but she could still hear him speaking in the mysterious language. And in spite of her fear, she could not prevent the shed of curiosity that made her pause and glance up at him. She realised in that brief moment of clarity that his hand around her wrist was not an iron of restriction, clamped around her like a manacle. In fact, astonishingly, he was not hurting her at all. The mirror creaked like ice, shifting on a frozen river, the sound making her tremble most fiercely. He was opening the portal, desperation inundated her like a spring flood, and she pulled against his restraining grasp more vehemently. 
but he did not even turn his head, holding her up against his side. He crossed his arms over his shoulders and pinned her against him, turning the edge of one broad wing towards her furious flashings to threaten any further resistance with a glinting ten-inch spine. Suddenly her training returned to her, and words of protection filled her mind. She gasped them out in haste, but her voice was little more than a choked squeak. Regardless of the weakness in her chanting, however, his reaction was instantaneous, pausing in his notification. He turned his head to look down at her with obvious irritation, pressed a cruel barb on his wing to her soft skin under her chin, and raised his hand from her shoulder to cover her mouth. There was nothing more she could do to protect herself. She had been defeated in her first and only battle. She knew she was utterly lost. Turning back to the mirror, he began again. The unrecognisable words still ringing in her ears like chimes, spinning her senses. She was falling under his spell. She was unable to struggle. Unable to speak her own protection. Unable to do anything other than listen as he opened the portal and wrought her destruction. Yet, even in her panic-stricken state, she could not prevent her overly inquisitive mind from lucidly noting that his hand pressed over her mouth was not hurting her. He did not bruise her lips under the ferocity of his contact. He did not wrench her head backward with cruel disregard. He did not restrict her breathing. He was simply thwarting her ability to speak. Why was he being so shockingly careful about not hurting her? Why had he permitted her to protect Vosherin with delight as well as spell? Why had he pulled the nursery door closed quietly behind, proceeding to drag her down the hallway towards the mirror? She could not comprehend his entirely incongruous behaviour. Moreover, she had always been told the reviled were cold-blooded, heartless creatures, that the touch of a dark fear was icy as death itself. Yet, pressed up against him, as she was, his surprising warmth was undeniable. The mirror creaked more loudly, drawing her back to the horror of her present situation. With these calamitous musings confusing her thoughts, she strained to see around his vast pinions and broad shoulders to watch the mirror with morbid curiosity. Tiny shards like crystalline ice were stretching across the reflective pane. Each splinter a minuscule prism that reflected any spark of light in the room, even the ineffectual glimmer of her diminishing aura, and his ever-real dark crimson glow, with each word he spoke the crystals increased, growing in number, dimension and intensity, until they spread across the glass like frost on a winter window, scraping and creaking like snow scrunching underfoot on the coldest day. The shards in the mirror began to reflect their own luminosity, and as he continued to speak the lustre of the mirror intensified. Then the mirror resounded with a deafening crack, and she flinched abruptly, a sharp cry escaping her muffled mouth. Even the dark one recoiled from the force of the sound and fell silent. Petrified, she squeezed her eyes tightly closed and held her breath. He had opened the portal. His kind would soon rush in, and then she would pray for death long before it would come. In her terror, she could not breathe. Blackness swirled at the edges of her mind, and her knees grew weak, almost imperceptibly. She began to collapse, sliding down the length of his strong frame, with no measure of power left within her to break her fall. Without a sound, the dark one turned his head to look down at her, and released her. He did not drop her or throw her to the floor like a worn-out plaything. He took her by the shoulder and by the hand and lowered her to the floor at his feet. Her thoughts swirled at this additional peculiarity, and before she lost herself to fear completely and was swallowed up by blackness, she opened her eyes to peer up at him wanly, utterly bewildered. The room was bathed in light, the mirror was intact, not lying in a multitude of shattered pieces on the floor as she had expected, and somehow it stood aglow with radiant incandescent light that sparkled and reflected on its own shimmering. Blinking woozily in the brilliance, she gazed up at him and drew a deep breath. What had she done? And if you want to buy Dark Fair the Reviled by Cynthia Morgan, you can find it on Amazon and I'll be including links in the write-up. 
So thanks for listening to today's extract and tune in next time. Bye for now.